I don't know how many of you at your house are putting decorations or they put it at another house that you used to live with. Maybe you're not at the same house, right? And if you're not at the same house, you start thinking, I remember when I was at the other house, we used to put these decorations. We used to put these lights. There were certain people in my life that, uh, that used to make it so fun, but now they're gone. Now they're not with me anymore. You might have some friends as well that used to hang around with you. And those friends, you used to do all these things. You used to get ready for Christmas and go around with them and remember all these things as well. So you start going through all those memories just thinking of the good times. Could it be the people? Could it be the house? Could it be the friends? Why not? Even the snow in Texas, right? Remember those days when we all often say, well, there's, there's no snow in Texas. But then a few years, we started getting snow. You're like, oh, yeah, that's kind of out of the world for you to get snow in Texas. If you live in Texas long enough, you know that often doesn't happen. But we have some of those. I don't know about you, but I was in shorts yesterday. We're walking at the mall, and I'm thinking, well, we're in December, and here we are. It is hot. It is not cold. So kind of miss the cold to kind of feel the season, right? But then you start thinking about, well, that's part of life. Those are things that keep on changing. And I want to show you how the word of God sort of prepares us for these things. And I mean growing up. Because often people don't realize they just have grown up. And they outgrew a lot of things. Whether it's the clothes, whether it's the place, whether it's the people. And the problem with that is it can create a lot of friction in your life if you don't realize right away. Why? That's why I want you to go to the word and kind of reflect on that. Because maybe this preaching will teach you some things about have I grown up? Have I grown that part of my life? What's next? What should I do next? What happened when my friends stopped going to church? Should I stop going to church because my friends don't go to church anymore? Should I stop playing an instrument because a lot of the people I used to play with don't play? Should I start gathering around or going to this place when I, all of a sudden I turn around and the familiar face I used to see are not there? What does it mean to grow up? And what does it mean when you don't realize you actually outgrew a lot of the things? I want you to go to the word on Ecclesiastes 7.14. Ecclesiastes? I have trouble pronouncing that word. Oh, yeah, okay. I thought I was the only one. I even went last night in searches, like, how do you pronounce this? It's like, okay. Ecclesiastes 7.14. And I want you to see what the word says. Because it's real. It's like... It's like a glass of water when you're thirsty. It really punches the gut when it talks about good times. Everybody there? You can find it in your phone right now at the speed, in, uh, at the speed of light. Remember back then you used to go through the Bible and, and then your parents would say, well, shouldn't you know that by now? Like, well, with the phone is a lot easier. But here's what it says. When times are good, what does it say? Well, okay, maybe nobody made it there, but here it is. When times are good... The word says, be happy. When times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, check this out. Consider this. Wait a minute. Pause for a minute. What is God telling me? So when, God, when times are good, you got to be happy. Yeah, who? But when times are bad, we often don't think things are pretty cool. We actually think, what's going on? How come I found my situation on this situation? Or, you know, did I do something wrong? Is the world against me? Is it because I'm a Christian? Is it because what? Because my friend don't hang around the same places and they just think I'm an outcast? What's going on? But God says, consider this. But then he goes on to say, God has made the one as well as the other. But you need to have both. You need to have both moments. And why is that? Well, we all know, we often say, well, you got to learn from time. So when you're happy, you can realize you're happy. When you're sad, you got to learn some lessons through it. And then appreciate the other one as much as you appreciate, you know, the good ones. There's a reason for all those things. But oftentimes, when we're little, we don't think that. It's like when a parent says, no, you can't have that. You're like, why I can't? All my friends have it. Like a phone. <laughs> I remember when I first started talking to my daughter about getting a phone. And I'm, I was telling her, well, you're not getting a phone until you're 16. And she's like, Dad, you're so old school. My friends got phones since they were like four or five. How come I can't have a phone? I'm like, well, you're not getting one. I'm sorry. You're going to wait till you're 16 or probably 20. We'll see how's that. 
see if you can. And then you, we started joking around. Eventually, she got a phone before 16, obviously. But then there's times when you start remembering, why are there those four? Because God wants you to start discovering things in your life as you grow up. And if he only gives things to you for good and you don't realize the negative, you start not appreciating the things that God has in store for you. It has to be sort of a growth. It has to be sort of a stretch, kind of like a muscle, right? If you don't go through that, how do you know you can lift 200 pounds if you never lifted 10 pounds to begin with, right? There's a, there's a share to that. There's some lessons to learn on that, and it's really important. Important. I want you to follow on 15, right there where we were on Ecclesiastes uh, 714. I'm going to read 15. 15 says, in this meaningless life of mine, I have seen both of this, good and bad, all right? I have seen both of this, good and bad. The righteous perish in their righteousness, and the wicked living long in their wickedness. So you still see people that often are good people, and they're gone before the bad people. And we often ask the same question. How come people, good people always end up leaving? And how come, how come uh, bad people still stay in their lives and are doing all these evil things, and the good people end up going? Well, they're probably already served their purpose, and they're gone, if you put it that way. And the bad people, their purpose is to continue to be more evil, and they continue to stay. No wonder why the world keeps on turning the way it is, because people sometimes don't realize if they're being a tool for who. You know, I often tell people, do you realize sometimes that the devil is working overtimes? And like, what do you mean? Yeah, if you say, I work for God and I do all these things, and then we fall into the trap that we start gossiping and talking about all these other people, are we working for God? Or we're working for the opposite team? Think about that. How much time do I spend talking of God? And how much time I spend talking of all these other nonsense things sometimes without even knowing? He's doing overtime. He's putting more hours in. Think about that. Now, what is the reward when you work overtime? What does that mean? You know, oftentimes you see all these people that come out on YouTube and do all these videos, and, and all of a sudden they seem like they're having a great life. And, and they show you, oh, look at me. I'm doing all this money. Come and buy my course or, or come and buy my lessons or come and do what I do, only to find out a few months later that that wasn't even true. It was just a facade. It was just a stage, right? And people tend to follow that more, right? So reality is we don't know what the future holds. This is important because we often wonder what it will be like in the future. Where would I be? Will I be in this church? Will I be in another church? Will I be serving? Will I be doing all these things for God? Right? But just like I said, I can ask you, how many of you still hang around with the friends from kindergarten? Oh, geez. Well, I don't even remember their name, brother. <laughs> I don't either. Yeah, I left mine in Mexico. Say, y'all can't come. Yeah, I got to stay there. <laughs> But here's the thing, the friends, the people that you have right next to you, they, not might, they might not be around you. You might find yourself sitting there on the chair like, why am I even here listening to this brother talk about this? Because it's true, life keeps on changing. The friends that you made in kindergarten are no longer here. The friends that you probably made during elementary school, they're probably not around you anymore. And guess what? The so on is going to happen for high school. The so on is going to happen for college. And it's going to happen when you get married. Hell, the people that sometimes... We think about it, that they're going to be with us, could be family members, could be loved ones. We never know if they're going to be by our side. We might think of getting old, but none of those people might be around. We made our plans, we made our decisions thinking, oh, some person is going to be with me. Oh, certain friend is going to be with me. And guess what? We often make the mistake to put the eyes there instead of God. That's why the Bible said, do not see other people. Don't put the eyes on anything else. Put the guys in Jesus Christ. Why? Because that's not going to change at all. It won't. It will be solid all the way through. You can be in a dark area. You can be in a fun area. You can be in a questionable area. But if you keep your eyes on God, guess what? That's never going to change. You're never going to outgrow God. And that's the beautiful thing about growing up. Because if you realize soon enough that you're growing with God, that means other things as well. Here, simple. You see people that are stuck on a certain decade? 
and they're dressed up like in the 60s, all hippies, and <laughs> or, or, or 80s. He said, ah, I know my deal. He always wears that square shirt, you know, with the long hair here. He, he's, he loves, he remembers when he was young. But we also just kind of love that sort of time in our life. And what happens that we love it so much, the friends, the things that we used to do, the clothes that we used to wear. And if we don't, if we're not, if we're not careful, guess what? We find ourselves stuck in that time. It's like you begin a remodeling, but you never remodel that part of your life. You kept the room with the same wallpaper, same decorations, and that goes for yourself in the flesh. So you got to start thinking, if I move with time, am I changing the same way? You know, if that's for the, if that's for the modern times, like right now, we kind of dress ourselves accordingly, we think, right? What about it spiritually? Have you outgrown your Sunday morning you know, little kids' church, or not? Where you used to just go sit down and watch somebody preach, and that was it. That's all you had to do. Wait a minute. Can that be the same thing for physically? Like, I used to love cartoons and eat cereal. That's all I eat. You don't do that anymore. You're like, no, I need, I need some serious food, man. I, I can even cook myself some good food. What about it spiritually? What does that mean? How we grown up? Did we realize that we already outgrew? The spiritually way we came in the word. Am I supposed to do different things now? Or am I supposed to do the same things? Just come and sit in church and wait for somebody to deliver the message to me. And that's it. Guess what? You're going to get bored. Before you, you, before you find out, you're going to be out of church. And they're going to say, yeah, I already tried that. It was a Jesus time, but now I'm doing my own thing. Be careful. Because that's not realizing that you have outgrown some of these things. And you know what the important thing about it too is? That you will have to make decisions. Here's a key word, decisions. When you're little, you often have somebody else make decisions for you. It could be your parents. And sometimes they make some decisions. You're like, oh, my God, what did, what did dad just say? <laughs> that happens. That happens. And when you, when, when you, those that have kids can relate because probably our kids are doing the same thing. Like, oh, my God, dad, why didn't you say that? Why? <laughs> it happens. You don't realize, but it's time to make decisions. The problem is. Some people fail to make decisions. Some people make the wrong decisions. And some of the people don't make decisions at all. And you know what the problem is with that? When somebody else starts making decisions for you and they drag you across the mud just to get what they want. It is their schedule. It is their time. And they'll call you on Sunday. What are you doing? I got to go to church. What do you mean? What am I doing? Well, you know, our friends are going to go and do this thing. Like, yeah, that's you. I made a decision to go to church. My mom used to take me, grab me by the hand. George, we're going to go to church. But guess what? My mom is not that age to drive a car and take me to church anymore. I take my mom now. Come on, old lady. We're going. <laughs> she's not with me today. She said, usually when it's raining, she's like, I think I'm going to take her weather out and stay at home and watch it on TV. Fine. But it's my decision. And I was talking to my daughter about this. There's times where you're going to have to make decisions. And guess what? Your loved ones are not going to be there. Your friends are not going to be there. Probably I don't know what kind of decision you should make. But that's part of growing up. Here's the thought about this is, have you started thinking the kind of decisions you're making spiritually for your life? What does that mean? Do I know how to, do I have a talent? Do I begin to use that talent? Or I just tell somebody else, oh, yeah, yeah, I can do that too. But, I, yeah, I just don't have the time. You know, I got to do all this, all this stuff. But what does that mean? When do you begin to live your life? And then when do you stop saying somebody else's decisions are yours? Because, yeah, probably somebody made wrong decisions for us at one point. I get it. But from now on, are we going to live by somebody else's decisions? Does somebody tell me, well, yeah, I don't do that. I don't do that. Well, that's on their own. One thing I know, God is solid. He will always be solid. And he won't drag me to the, to, through the mud. I got to remember those times. So it's a big change. And I mentioned that because friends and loved ones might stop frequenting some of the places. I tell you, at church, I met a lot of friends here. And guess what? A lot of those friends don't come to church anymore. It hurts me. 
Those are people I used to go out to eat after church. Those are people I used to laugh in the bench when we were saying things. Oh, they messed up. The musicians messed up. <laughs> or, you know, things like whatever. But, you know, you make fun and you remember and you have good times. Remember looking up in the ceiling and seeing all the balloons falling off and all the things from New Year's and taking pictures around the church? Sometimes you don't see that there anymore. And what do I do? Do I stop going to church because of that? Do I say, well, is that the same? Well, maybe it's not the same for them. But what about me? Do I know what God has in store for me? And it's really funny because you start thinking that sometimes the actions of other people have nothing to do with you. But they do. They do. And why? Because you start putting your eyes on what other people do. You don't realize this, but you realize I'm on my own. You know, and, you know, my friends don't want to hang around. But you know what? That's part of growing up. That's part of growing up. Parents can tell you sometimes they can't, they can't see their kids growing up, too. They have a hard time. Sometimes they don't want the kids to grow up. I don't know if you have a parent sometimes that will say, well, Mom, I'm not that age anymore. Don't, don't talk to me like that. <laughs> don't, you know, you got to think about that. Well, parents also go through a difficult time sometimes letting us grow up. I'll give you a good example. Our pastor, you know how many people he has seen come to church, born spiritually, and then leave? You might not realize this, but that is painful what he goes through. He's seeing people come in the door broken, in pieces, not knowing anything about God, then being part of what this church is, and then all of a sudden you have to let go. And you do that constantly. It's tough. It's tough. You know why? That's why there's a lot of pastors out there that get, you know, depressed, that sometimes get dragged by the people because they're not happy because certain things are good in a certain way. But then the people that is there, they forgot that they grew up and they got to help. They got to do all these things. So the same thing spiritually happened to us. At some point, I got to start cleaning my room. At some point, I got to start doing something for my house. The same thing for the house of the Lord. And what does that mean? It might mean I might have to cook some of the meals the pastor used to cook for all of us. Somebody needs to start preaching. Somebody needs to start singing. Somebody needs to be part of the message. So the question is, what should I do, right? I want you to go to the first Timothy 6, and I'm going to read from uh, 6 to 7, right? First Timothy 6, 6 to 7. When you ever have that question that you see people act in a certain way and you've got, what should I do? God tells us right here, right in our notes, it says, 6, it says, but godliness with content is great gain. Let me repeat that to you. But godliness with, great, with content is great gain. And then number 7 says, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. Here. I use an example. I was listening to this pastor. He was talking about how many times he's had been to a hospital to pray for people that they're dying, right? And a lot of people in the common days, it was really common that, hey, let's bring a, a, a father or a pastor from a certain church to pray for the person that is about to die. They're about to be departing this, this place. So they would like to feel peace at the, at, at, at the last minute. So the pastor goes and he says he normally prays for people, right, and tells them, you know, how do you feel? Would you like to make good with God and all these things? But then he made a comment. He said, you know what? On all those years that I've been going to hospitals or the last minute for those people who are about to die, I never once, never once met somebody that said, oh, I'm so proud of my Tesla. Please bring it here so I can see it on my last minute. I would just would like to appreciate what I accomplished in life by buying me a Tesla. Or I want you to bring my PhD that I have accomplished from college because I want to spend my last time hugging my accomplishment in life. Or the same thing for cash. You know what? Bring all the money out of the bank. I just want to smell it before I leave. Nobody does that. Nobody in their last minute, in the last breath, will start thinking about their accomplishment. But you know what they will start thinking? About the things they miss about the things that somehow they overlooked. 
about the things they didn't realize were important. So here's the thing. It is your choice when you're growing up to say what's more important to you. I'm not saying none of these things is important. Who wouldn't like to have, I don't know, if you like electrical vehicles like a Tesla or have a PhD or have all this money in the bank. There's nothing wrong with that. But what I do say is that be careful that you realize that you don't grow up, you don't grow up thinking that that is all that matters. Because you can find yourself thinking, I go to the church I go because my friends go there. That's a good thing, but that shouldn't stop you or put your spirit down from serving the Lord. In fact, you start thinking, I go there because I know who I'm serving, because I know the reason I'm going to. Or maybe Brother George just talks a lot, but hopefully there's some sense to this, and it makes some sense to you, because think about it. Nobody, nobody would thought certain people wouldn't be on our lives at a certain time, but yet the life goes on. What does that mean to you? 1 Timothy 6.11, right there on the same one. I'm just going to jump to 11, okay? And it says, but you, listen to this. This is like a hit on the head, like, tengala. But you, men of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. It's funny sometimes that for the things that are free, we want nothing of it, but for the things that cost money, we're willing to spend hours at work just so we can get money and go buy them, only to sell them or trade them for less money. How many of you have ever purchased something, and then you bring it home, and then you just get it out of the box and just put it there like, yeah, I bought it. And then within a week, you're like, why, why did I buy that? Huh? <laughs> it's like, yeah, but I like it. It's mine. I have it in my house. And then a week later, it's like, man, what should I put this thing? Because I need to, I need to move the boxes. And, like, and then you put it there, like, okay. And then you come back, and it seems like you move it like 10 times throughout the year because you're decorating the room. It's like, well, I don't need, go ahead, put it in the garage sale. I don't need it anymore. <laughs> They're like, wait a minute. Remember you were all upset because you were the first one in line trying to get it? And now you have it, and now you don't need it. So growing up means change will happen physically and spiritually. I mentioned that. Because it is a big deal. It means mainly you're going to have to start making decisions. We often make decisions in the real world. My question to you today, and I hopefully I pound on this message today, is that are you asking the same questions for your spiritual life? What is that meaning to my life? Now, do you know people that refuse to grow up too, right? You might see older people. But sometimes they don't make the wisest decisions. And then you figure, well, yeah, he might be like 50, but, oh, God, he, sometimes his decisions are like a teenager. He quickly gets upset. He says, I'm not doing this and doing that. Part of that is, did they let go part of that, right? And the other thing is, are they afraid of growing up? Because why? What does that mean? That means it's on you, the responsibilities, that means it's you, the one that has to decide if that's going to affect your life. I want you to go to Matthew 15, 14. Sometimes it hurts to lose communications with loved ones. Sometimes it hurts finding yourself thinking, well, who am I going to hang around with? Sometimes it hurts knowing that you had all these wonderful memories with certain people. Um, but it's hard to cut the court and say, I got to let go. I got to let go because this is not doing me any good. And you might say, I tried everything. But when you get to the point that I got to depart from God, is that really necessary? So what does Matthew 15, 14 says? It says, leave them. They are blind guys. If the blind lead the blind, both what what will fall into a pit. I have a half brother. His name is Henry. Um, he's sort of my age. He's a few months. He's actually from June. I'm from November. And years ago, I received the news that he was put in jail. And he, he was living in Chicago for maybe his childhood, right? And then he came to our house in Houston. He was going to spend some time with us. At first, I had some resentment. Hey, who's this guy? 
not even my brother. It's a half-brother. What's the deal here? But then he says something. He's like, look, it's not my fault. Right? Whatever that did, it's not my fault. What you want me to do? So knowing the word of God and what I knew, I couldn't hold on to my anger. I couldn't say whatever I wanted to say. But really, he hit me with that word, and I'm like, you know what? There's nothing I can do there. So anyways, we became good friends. We started doing all these things together. It's crazy, loud, doing all these things. But then things started changing for him. Why? Because he wasn't used to sort of rules of the house. We used to do crazy things to each other. But then he was not used to being organized. He was not used to having a schedule in life. He was not used to answering with respect to others. He was just all over the place. But I loved him, my brother Henry. What happened with Henry is he started coming here, and then he started going to school, and then he started going to, to church. And then the first day he went to church, I remember, because somebody invited him. I kept on inviting him. I didn't want him to go, but then he went to work. He started working on refineries. He started liking the money he was making, and then all of a sudden, he said, you know what? Somebody at work invited me to church. I said, I've been inviting you to church for the longest. You don't want to go. Like, oh, yeah, you're different, man. You're like, I don't know, one of those kids from church. I ain't going with you. Anyways, he went to church. He came back that afternoon. He was like blown away. You can tell like God wanted to deal with him. So he's oh, man, I got, oh, it was fabulous. And then this guy was playing the accordion and doing all these things. And it was such a wonderful time. I had a church. So he was so amazed, right? So that happened one Sunday. The following weekend, he went to church as well. But I didn't see him in that afternoon. So the following Monday, I talked to him. And he was really upset. And I said, what happened, Henry? And I'm going back to church again. I said, and why is that? And he's like, because Sunday I went to church, and I had a good time at church. But right that afternoon, I got hit by another vehicle. Somebody stole my radio, and I don't know what else happened to you. Anyways, I'm fired from work because I couldn't make it in the morning. So what does that have to do with going to church? He's like, you know, I realized all this time that I was doing good, God had nothing to do with my life. The minute I start going to church, all these things, all these bad things happen. So I'm not going to church. His perception about God is the minute I got close to God is the minute bad things have started to happen to me. Not realizing that evil was chasing him, trying for him not to walk away from that situation. Oftentimes we're going to have friends that they're going to be chased by the same situation. And what I'm saying this is remind them about growing up the world as well. Remind them about the things that they used to do. They're going to have to let go if they really want to live a good life with God. And I realize some of this stuff you've probably heard of before. But it's a big mistake when we end up following them because of what they think it is the correct thing to do. Amen? I remember I told you about the old people sometimes acting or being stuck, right? Well, the same thing spiritually is what we have to look for, right? Right? Let's see, I have another note here from my memory. I want you to see if you can please go to Psalm 32, 8. Somebody say amen if you get there. God says here, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. You know, last Thursday I was talking at my, at my service uh, sector that we have, and I was talking about hungry for God. And I was saying how sometimes when we're hungry, we can feel it on our gut. It starts making noise, right? I don't know how many of you have been there. We even had a dog one time, and we were watching TV, and the dog was just laying there watching TV with us. I'm saying watching. I don't know what he was looking at, but he seemed entertained. And then all of a sudden, the dog made a noise in his stomach. And you could tell the dog did not know what, what was that. He looked at the belly and like, <laughs> he barked about it. Well, here's the thing. Physically, that's what it kind of reveals when you're hungry. Something tells you there's something going on. And it could be your belly, your gut, or it could be your temper, right? You start, how many of you, I don't know, start getting uneasy when you're like, haven't eaten anything. You're like, I need, to, I need to grab something to eat. 
In the heart, it's the same way. Your heart starts speaking up. Your heart starts saying things. Things that it bothers you. Things that get you upset. Anyways, the reason I say that about being hungry is because a lot of people don't plan for that or be fed with the word of God. They get fed all the time for all anything out there that they need to. But when it comes to the word of God, you know what? Whatever meal somebody prepares is not good for you anymore. What I mean is, if you come into this service, it doesn't matter if a brother is my uh, praise or, or Juan. At some point, we're probably going to say something that you heard before, right? And you say, oh, yeah, I heard that before. Oh, yeah, I heard that before. But if you don't realize that with that growing up that you did so much of feeding yourself with the word of God, if you're not start practicing in a certain way or using it, eventually it's going to get really bored to you. Eventually it's going to make you get discouraged. It is good for you, but you have to use it. What does that mean? Do you have to get involved in the ministry? Do you have to start thinking about writing a new song from your heart? Do you, it's going to cost some effort. It's going to cost some sacrifice. But not becomes easy. If it's not the same way for school, it's not going to be the same way for this. And this has happened on a lot of churches. People get fed like a buffet. You know, they go and eat, they eat, they eat, they eat. And they walk away from the buffet like thinking, oh, how can people be eating right now when you already stuff yourself, right? And you're thinking, oh, they shouldn't be eating all that. Yeah, but you already ate all this, so for you it's good. Same thing happens to us spiritually. We get fed and fed every Sunday. We have all these different words. Yes, they're good. But what are we doing with it? Are we doing something about it? Are you sharing it with somebody? Are you inviting somebody to church? Are you putting a challenge in your life? How many of you have put a challenge in your life about getting somebody to church? Anybody? Yeah, no. They chase me if I do. What is your new way to start thinking about bringing somebody to church? There's no other way to get to God but to find Jesus. But there's ways, so many different ways to bring somebody to church. What is the intention behind it? What is the conversation behind it? Do people realize that? No. Amen? Somebody here? So, are people hungry for the word of God? You might think they're not, but they are. They're starving. I'll be honest with you. I was talking about uh, last few Sundays when I mentioned this, and they asked this question to Elon Musk. Why are you so afraid of AI? And I asked him, why are you, are you so afraid of AI? He says, because it will kill us. And then they say, well, wh why would you think of that? It's because it's free will on its own. It not, doesn't have the morale like we do. Think about this. He said this. He says, the chip that is on the phones for face recognition, you can put it on a drone. And then you can put an explosive charge. You know what that drone will do? The drone will search and find. And then eventually, once it recognizes your face, it will explode. That's how easy the technology is now. It will find and search and destroy. In the system, you are an object that is kind of underway. Here's the thing. When God made free will with us, he loves us so much that he gave a choice to us to make a decision. And the ultimate goal for humankind, I'll give you this, is to make free will. People don't know this, don't realize. But the ultimate goal in people's mind and heart is to create free will. God created this since the beginning. And God allowed us to do the same thing. When I said that moms can have kids that have free will, that's already been made. But for somehow humanity think that is the greatest goal to accomplish. But it's been made. It is already a reality. What's happening? Here's what's happening. People do not recognize signals. They're still losing. What is it called? A short attention span. Right? Have you heard of that? Have you heard of short, short attention span? The people are looking at somebody they can only hear them for like five minutes. Yeah, brother, I just heard you were, your name, but I didn't get the rest of the preach. <laughs> what are you saying? Yeah, well, that's what I was talking about. Short attention span. I mentioned this last Thursday. People see something on the social media. And they immediately start acting. And the signals are there in front of their faces, and they don't see it. And I mentioned this last Thursday. I said, when the, the, when the, the red moons have started coming up, people say, oh, God is coming. God is coming. The red moons, there's red. People all over the social media were talking. What do you know about this? Is it true? Is it on the Bible? Is it God coming? And then nothing happened. And people, it's like they went back to sleep. They let it go. Right? They forgot. And then 
the sound in the sky where the trumpets. I don't know if you saw some of those videos where they had sound in the sky and there was all this noise and all of a sudden the birds will fly from the trees and the, the sound of the sky will come different parts of the world. Alarms will sound and people are like, oh, you see that? God is coming. God is coming. And God didn't come. But people were like, God will come. And then nothing happened and it's like people fell asleep the same way. Right? And then COVID-19 hit. And there was a few signs before that, but COVID-19 hit, and like, oh, God is coming, God is coming, and God is coming. A louder, a louder noise. Notice each time it has been different, but it's loud. And people get all excited, and all of a sudden people get religious. I'm going to church because God is coming. <laughs> but it's only momentarily. It's only during that moment that they feel afraid of it. COVID-19 happened. Guess what? There's a vaccine. There's all these things. But people figure, well, that's just the virus. Let it go. Now, I was mentioning a few weeks, is, there's a be some videos of animals running in circles. You've probably seen that, right? And then people are saying the same thing. What does that mean? Look, animals, how they behave and, and doing all these things. God is coming. God is coming. I don't know if you haven't catch on to the movie, but all those things are coming more frequently. And this line up with what the Bible says, you will see things that you've never seen before. And guess what? People only get excited momentarily, and then they lose track of that. If I was you, I'd start thinking, how is my heart with God? How I outgrow the world and grow with God? Because most people outgrow God and went to the world. And that's why the churches are empty. And that's why people don't feel like looking for God. Because what? They think they know more than God. And they think they will pass that test or they will pass whatever. Guess what? They're going to find themselves that when the next sign, it might be God and might not be it. So what I'm saying here is think about what kind of growth you have in your life. Think about is it time for you to do something with the church? Is it time for you to start helping here on the ministry? Is it time for you to start saying, I need to get better at what I do. I need to take it more seriously. I need to see if I can talk to somebody and preach about the word of God. I need to start looking about who my friends are. And I realize what kind of conversations are we having? Do they have anything to do related to God? I'm not saying you're going to be mentioning verses and all that. That's not going to happen, probably. But do they know that you're solid with God? Do you know you keep that in your life? Otherwise, is it more telling about who you are? You know, often people will see me and say, yeah, George, or whatever, we get friends. But sometimes they tell me, without me saying it then, and I can tell you, I'm not, I'm not talking to them about, you know, got to go to church or whatever. It's they come to me and say, hey, you go to church, right? You say that because I pray for my meals? It's like, no, no, I notice just sometimes the way you talk or the way you approach certain things, I can tell something different. It's like, yeah. It's like, you want to hear about it? Like, yeah. And then we get into the science, we get into the technology, and I start bringing the whole gospel just the same end point, but maybe on different things they never thought about it. And they're like, wow, how do you know that? I'm like, yes, God made all that. It's just people don't want to listen to it. Because they think it's the old school method. But it works every time. Because God is solid. Nothing else is solid. My friends have changed. My family have changed. People I love with all my heart probably have moved on and do other things. But guess what? God is still in my life. And guess what? I need to keep on doing the same thing. I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm a tool for God. And I know he has certain things for me. I don't know them all. But guess what? I'm willing to listen to those that are thinking about why do we serve God? Or they want to know why do we serve God? It, 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 God. And we, even we serve them with love in our heart because I know it's kind of like a sword. I tell you, that thing right there, that Bible, whether you're looking at it through a book or a phone, it's so sharp. And I mean so sharp. And, 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 and I have even cried about God because sometimes the knowledge you, you, you get to know is so sharp. If you're not careful, it will cut you, and it will cut you deep. And I keep on saying this because I want you to take respect for what's written there. I know you do, but also when you joke or talk to your friends, because if you don't, you might find yourself following part of their life. And that's the scary things that sometimes, because people say, well, I don't know why they want to go to church. They just want followers. Hello? Isn't that what you see in Instagram? People want followers? Isn't that what you see on YouTube, that people want followers? Isn't that what you see on, 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 on every platform? Everybody wants their own followers. Why is that? 
So God, what is God is asking is really out? Think about this. What effect does it have in your life? And I know we're short on time, 11.22, getting close to it. So I hope this preaching kind of gives you something to think about, something, some thought in your life about growing up. Have you outgrown the world? What does it mean to you growing up? Are you making decisions? What kind of decisions? Do you realize that the other people, what decisions are they making for their life? What are the reasons for you to make your decisions? You know, we need more preachers here in English, so anybody that comes and won't take the mic, I would like to learn from some of y'all. That's all I'm going to say, because people need God. Honestly, people need God. And, 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 and people don't realize how much they need them, but they need them. They need them. People said they don't, they don't need them. You know, how many people are asking for advices on Facebook or YouTube or any of those? All of a sudden, everybody's a teacher. You got to wonder why is that? Because God made us like that. We have to tell others. Amen? That's the word I have for you. That's the, the word that God allowed me to share with you this afternoon. I mean, this morning. So hopefully it gives you some thoughts, something to think about. And I hope it was a blessing for your life. Amen? So let's stand up and let's pray before we uh, get to go to the back. I mean, go to the front. If you please bow your head. Heavenly Father, thank you for today's message. Thank you for the word that you allowed me to share this morning, God. I know, God, that it landed in good hearts. It landed in the minds and the spirits of my brothers and sisters. I ask you to please help them with the decision making. Help them, God, with some of the doubts they might have in their life. Help them maybe clean some of those areas, God, that they need to clean. In Jesus' name, we thank you. We we ask you to please be with us the rest of the week. Guide us during the work, school, whatever they have going on. Help them out. Thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, brother and sister.